Let's Podcast alongside Joe Giglio. I'm Joe Ovias inside Eford Studios in downtown Raleigh. Thanks to Empire Properties and thanks to Copiers Plus. Check them out online at copiers-plus.com. Uh, Joe is very, very happy. He got his SMU hoodie. Is it like the Pony Express? Uh, they got to have a hand signal, right? I don't even know what the... I think the hand signal is that. <laughs> it's just this. It's just money. It's right... In it, it's, it, put, put it on the athletic department. Yeah, uh, it, uh, uh, we're, we're writing a check. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Here you go. Here you go. We're so rich, we don't need... We don't even need the ACC's money. Oil. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, you're you're very excited about your hoodie. I see that it's the triple D. Well, I was looking at the AP. I'm not the AP, but the coaches top 25, the USA Today coaches top 25. I did not see SMU oh, in the boom. preseason top 25. Uh, That's we, just ACC bias right there, man. That must be the case. That must be the case. I see uh, Alabama for real, Georgia. No, I'm I'm saying like in the I have not looked at this. So obviously Georgia is the preseason favorite. Yes, yeah. makes sense. Ohio State feels really good about their roster. Mm -hmm. Got it. Oregon, new quarterback. I don't I'm not buying Oregon. Texas, super talented, still the most talented team in the country. Not sure how they'll handle an SEC schedule this year. Alabama has like a whole new roster, new coach, new situation. The guy following the guy. Uh, when Chip Patterson comes in on Thursday, he'll give you the stat. I don't have it off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. basically one team every year in the top 10 that's in the preseason top 10 does not finish in the top 10 actually doesn't even finish ranked. Uh, Al Alabama has that potential. Uh, not old miss just being protect. No, I, I'm actually bullish on okay. old miss. They, they are in their old, they're in their all in phase. Yeah. I always am skeptical of a Mississippi team really, you know, breaking through in these never, situations. Never forget the very first college football playoff, uh, BCS rankings, Mississippi state one, Ole miss two. Yes. And how'd yes. that, how'd that work out? <laughs> Exactly. About what you would think. And then our old friend, Riley Leonard. Yeah. Number seven. You're going to hear that name a lot this year. You thought the Sam house or the, uh, the Sam, um, I'm forgetting my Sam. Oh, your Sam's Hartman. Sam Hartman was getting all the love. Oh, Riley's oh, an all American wait. baby. Just wait. And then we got, uh, you got Michigan, Penn state, Florida state. What I the find drink. interesting. Don't forget now the 12 gets us to the playoff. It does. Oh, it gets Brian us. Kelly is there. not coming. Math. Home. Family <laughs> not coming home. So what I find interesting here is that uh, keep going. I, no, but I, hold on. I haven't seen it. <laughs> I just wanted to make a real quick point about the top 10. Okay. Right. Which grounds out with Florida state. Yes. If you count Notre Dame as an ACC squad. Oh, okay. Which we're not going to, because it's they get a, a full vote. It's not a pandemic season. They get a full vote. Okay, fine. We'll make them ACC. <laughs> you got it's, this is where the realignment starts to mess with you. Yeah. You got, yeah, SEC, Big Ten. Oh, yeah, Oregon's Big Ten. Oh, yeah, okay. Texas is SEC, SEC now. And uh, obviously, Florida State is in the ACC. You've got Clemson at 14, Tennessee at 15, who NC State will see. Well, yeah. where's the Wolf back? Well, you got Miami at number 19, and there's NC State coming in at 22, oh, which is about where you would gross. expect NC State to be. Carolina State. Come on. What do you mean, gross? Uh, they spelled it out. Just oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that's whatever. I mean, they're not University of Southern California. I'm going right to highlight this them. right here. Look at that, Joe. The apps. They app have the state. most interesting schedule of anyone uh, they certainly in do. our state this year. I will tell you that right now. North sir. Carolina got some votes as well. So there you go. Yeah, they, got, Smoo, they got six votes. I think SMU and Louisville are both going to be good teams this year. Uh, West Virginia finished the year well last year. Liberty is a team that has playoff designs. Mm -hmm. Remember, one of the old group of five has a guaranteed spot. The highest ranked group of five team yeah. is a spot. So um, obviously those are, that's the vote, the coaches vote. That's the coaches. Yeah. And, and I mean, listen, the college football playoff committee doesn't really veer that much from the, the human polls. No, it's so doesn't. not too much. Ultimately it'd be interesting to see how all of that shakes out. Again, scheduling is going to determine everything this year. I, there's just no way you're going to knock me off of that. Which is why North Carolina and NC State are probably pretty interesting because I think we all recognize their schedules are very manageable. Absolutely. Very manageable. Uh, and we, I got an email, or we got an email to the OG account uh, from Matt. And Matt had highlighted an ESPN plus story about underachieving football programs. Uh, and he took issue with the fact that NC State made this list. But there's context here. And this is from guys like Bill Conley and Adam Rittenberg over at ESPN. Mm -hmm. This is an insider article. And what they tried to do, Bill, if you're not familiar with Bill Conley, he has a thing called SP+. It's yeah. essentially the Ken Palm of college football. It is a predictive measurement, much like Ken Palm is a predictive measurement. So it's not about what you've done. It's 
putting all the data in and expecting what you should be doing. Um, so the paragraph reads, for the first time, we're incorporating an expected S&P Plus rating based on recent recruiting rankings, long-term history, stadium capacity, and where available coaching, coaching staff salaries. Comparing this number to each team's actual five-year S&P Plus average gives us a unique look at who is performing at a level su sufficient to expectations. We focused on team data from the past five seasons, but also look at long-term snapshots to, ex to examine trends and identify why they've fallen short. And they break them up into tiers. You have your CFP no-shows, under the projections, hoops or else. <laughs> Where do you think North Carolina shows up in this one? Never won big. Money problems could have done more. Who's next? So CFP no-shows reads like a list that makes a lot of sense. Penn State, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. Florida, what are we doing here? The Trojans. CFP. Okay. So that era, like specifically. that era specifically. Okay. And of course, you've got Miami. Um, in fact, I could point to the Hurricanes not being in the college football playoff as a prime reason why the ACC doesn't get a lot of uh, attention, if you will. Right? Yeah. Uh, or they're they're not talked about the way that you would talk about the SEC or the Big Ten. Texas A&M is also in there for somebody who's never shown up in the college football playoff as an underachiever. Okay. And then the biggest underachievers, you know, basically coming in below their S and P projections. Nebraska makes a lot of sense. Arkansas makes a lot of sense. You get the basketball or bust here. There's UCLA. And of course, there is North Carolina. And Bill Conley and the crew point out their assets, stuff we've all heard before. Flagship school in a solid recruiting state. Jordan brand affiliation. <laughs> we just got done talking about Julius Peppers yep. shouting out Michael Jordan hey man, to be I'm the reason here. why he went to UNC. <laughs> Consistent producer of high NFL talent. Again, all things that are there for North Carolina. Yeah. And, um, you know, they point out that they've made gradual facilities upgrades, X, Y, Z, uh, but they close out the paragraph with this. UNC, however, once again, has yet to translate the talent to team success. The Tar Heels only have two AP top 25 finishes since Brown's first go round as coach. When we talk about actual underachievers in college football, North Carolina fits that bill. I, I mean, even North Carolina fans would agree that they fit that bill uh, for all the advantages they have going for it. I actually disagree. Okay, how so? I, I think it's a mistake to try to compare the state of North Carolina to the rest of the country. Okay. Okay. I think we have a unique problem here in the state of North Carolina. One mm -hmm. that you had two teams on that higher list, right? Florida and Miami. Yeah. Right? Yeah, they're the they're the top tier. You had them in that top tier, top right? Tier. Never making the college football playoff okay. with everything they have going but for them. But let's think about the state of Florida. Okay. Yeah. Back in the day in the state of Florida, back in the day, the 80s and 90s, in the state of Florida, <laughs> time ago. there was Florida, there was Florida State, and there was Miami. Never forget that Miami, Frank Gore, was fourth on their depth chart, a three-star recruit out of Orlando. Well, what did he do? He went to Miami, and he sat on the bench. Yep. And then all of a sudden, you're talking about one of the most productive running backs in the history of the National Football League. Well, what was he doing? He was just biding his time on his on the bench. Mm -hmm. Well, now in the state of Florida, and now you again, you see these premier teams, and even Florida State went through this, by the way. Mm -hmm. You see these premier teams. Well, Frank Gore now, the three-star recruit out of Orlando, doesn't say, oh, I'm going to go sit on Miami's bench for a couple of years. He goes, oh, who's the hot shit down at FAU? I'm going to go play for Lane Kiffin. Central Florida is a problem. I'm going to go play State for right Josh now. Heupel at yeah. Central Florida. <laughs> even FIU had T.Y. Hilton. You know, but back in the day, all these guys are on one of these power teams, right? So I, I think that's, so you're seeing that in real time in, in the state of Florida. South Florida also has had their share of players. Mm -hmm. The state of North Carolina, it's not a new phenomenon. They've always had not only NC State in North Carolina, various levels of Duke, various levels of Wake Forest. ECU is a perennial problem in terms of recruiting, in terms of taking players. And then you add App State to that mm -hmm. in the last 25 years. So you're talking about six grown-ass programs that get their share of players. Well, I got news for you. If this was Michigan and Michigan State, well, guess what? <laughs> we would all be at Michigan or Michigan State, depending on who the who the hot shit coach was. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, uh, Ohio State. Oh, well, who the fuck are they competing against in Ohio? Akron? Hey. The you Ohio put, University? You put some respect on Ohio University. Get the fuck out of here. Miami of Ohio. Because you're cleaning up. 
You're cleaning up. Ben Roethlisberger. There's never been, there's never been a program in this state. There will never be a program in this state that cleans up. And it's not just because of who their coach is here. Yeah. It's because, would you say basketball or else? Basketball right? or else. You're talking about decades of a mindset. So who comes in here? Georgia comes in here. Hey, man, you know what would be awesome? You come play for us. Uh, the Leak brother who was Florida's uh, national championship quarterback mm-hmm. from Charlotte. Hey, hey, man, you want to go fool around at Carolina and never play and never be anything? Well, guess what? You can come here, win a national championship. Well, I mean, Dexter Lawrence at Clemson. State had state put four fucking defensive linemen in the NFL, and they still couldn't get a guy from their backyard because Clemson comes in and goes, "Awesome, you want to go eight and four? You want to go win the national championship?" Yeah, we didn't brought up Wolf Blood yet. Oh, don't get me started on the Wolf Blood. You know how I feel about the Wolf Blood. <laughs> we'll we'll ship. We haven't got to him yet. The mistake people, and it's a numbers, and I'm not saying Bill Connolly doesn't know what he's talking about. What I'm saying to you is the mistake people make in the state of North Carolina. Notre Dame comes in and gets players. Sure. You, there's never going to be a program in this state. First of all, the supply of players isn't as big as California, Florida, Georgia, where those other programs can run their roost. It right? is not. You have too many programs that are not great, but good. So it's not like a no brainer. Like, oh, what am I going to do? Am I going to go to Central Michigan or am I going to go to Michigan? Yeah, everyone fucking knows what you're going to do. Okay. And then lastly, no, in those other states, Nobody comes in and um, Florida. Yes, Florida will lose a kid to Ohio State. For, the state of Florida will lose players to, to yeah, Ohio so State, much. Penn I mean, State. You got to remember, Chuck Amato was coming in NC and starting state, to take advantage right? of the fact that you why sit on the bench at Florida State when you can play immediately at NC State. And you that know was who, a big deal for Chuck Amato. And you know back who then. else I haven't mentioned yet? Virginia Tech in the Tidewater area, oh, who's yeah. always come in here and gotten players that they've wanted. This is off North Carolina. South Carolina mm-hmm. has traditionally been able to come into here and get players that they've wanted. It's a totally unique situation. So while, yes, I hear you about the brand of North Carolina. Yes, I hear you about Michael Jordan. I hear you about the, the unbelievable setting and the pine trees and everything else. The truth of the matter is NC State, and I just here's the math, NC State all time. Their winning percentage is fifty one point four. That includes that includes the first forty years when they they basically had like two winning seasons when you know players were switching teams every other week. Um, and North Carolina's all time winning percentage is fifty five point six. How is that underachieving when this is what you're saying? Who you are? Well, there's a I think there's a separate conversation. The reason why I would say. And, and I've, let's it's, go. It, it's important to who wants to who you, I tell you people anybody can podcast on a Monday. You try this shit on a Tuesday, sir. You try it. Well, anybody can podcast on a Monday when they're not hung over. So that's kind of key. That's kind of key. There's tears. Oh, get me fired up with underachievers and sleeping giants. No, it's all their bullshit. You just don't understand it. There's tears to this. It's important to note that what Bill Conley's doing here, they're not positioning North Carolina in the same situation as Miami. They're not. It's simply pointing out. It's, I mean, it's, a, it's, it might be a similar <laughs> modern, problem. similar modern. The problem. point is that North Carolina is routinely viewed as the school that has every advantage going for it. They have more money. They have a better brand. They have Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. And every do they, time do they have more money for football, though, if they wanted to, because remember when they tried that, it was the Butch Davis era, and then it blew up in their face, and it affected basketball, which gets you to the basketball or else thing. And I think that irreparably damaged any sort of trajectory for football at North Carolina because, oh my God, it fucked with basketball. I think it's fair to say that North Carolina, as a program, has underachieved when you looked at every single one of the advantages they have in all the issues that you laid out about North Carolina. They still get the top talent. Of all the schools they when rec- they want to. They recruit better in this state than any other program. And that's the other key too. Annually, yes. When they want to. Because remember, Larry Fedora's, one of his biggest issues was he just abandoned the state. Mm-hmm. And all Mac had to do was come in with a helicopter and people went, oh, we're, Mac's back. Every And look, maybe I'm scarred by all the conversations I ever had with Steve Logan, who has all sorts of war stories about North Carolina, regardless of who the coach was. Yeah. Okay, because uh, he always used to joke, I could go find some kid that was not recruited, and then once the little old Steve Logan found him, all North Carolina had to do was give him a call. And suddenly, they were done because, oh my God, North Carolina called me. What am I going to do? So all of my all of my factoring in for North Carolina as an underachiever goes to that. 
You have every advantage. If you want the recruit, you're going to beat state for for the most part. You should be able to beat App State to get a recruit. You should be able to beat ECU out for a recruit, which of course ties into when ECU and App State beat North Carolina. What do you typically hear from ECU and App State? Oh, these guys didn't want me. Oh, yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So chip on your shoulder. They're 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 the big dog in the state. Yeah. Whether state fans want to hear that or not, they're the big dog in the state. And I think most state fans understand that. And what do they have to show for it? I mean, honestly, what do they have to show for it? They haven't won a division or they haven't won the, uh, the conference since 1980. They've been to two ACC championship games where they were clearly not the better team. I mean, onside kick us out against Clemson. Um, so in the last division, again, we saw they were not the better team. State's different. I think state's different. State's different for... I, state, I don't think is underachieved. I think state's kind of like what you would expect out of a program of state's level for all the things that you just laid out that happen to be going on in the state. When you bring up, well, why would I go to NC State when Clemson comes calling me? Why would I go to NC State when South Carolina? Like those things. You got to have a true love. I think or those a connection things, or yeah. a family member. And even that's know, not good enough. God sometimes. bless Dennis Smith, right? Right. So I think <laughs> my and, grandma was a state fan. I think it's, you know, as, as I get to Bill Conley's point on NC State, the Wolfpack have won averaging 7.8 wins over the past 10 years under Dorn have won eight or nine games 11 times since 2000, but NC State's inability to reach a 10-win plateau last accomplished in 2002 or end its ACC title drought is maddening. The Wolfpack lost 14 of 15 games to Clemson before winning two of the team's last three meetings. Other big, big game opportunities have gone against NC State, which hasn't had an AP Top 15 finish since 1974. Okay, So with NC State, there is, a, I think, a separate conversation. I think they're about where they should be for a program of that level, and the fact that they haven't broken through on those kind of things is a testament to, yeah, man, you just happen to be doing this while Clemson's running really, really hot. Oh, yeah, you know what? That's, an, you know, I don't want to say NC State shit, but it's like more of an anomaly that they haven't won 10 times than anything else. It doesn't make any sense. Right. Some of the I, things, just, they don't make sense. Yeah. But for the most part, NC State is a nine win kind of program when they are doing what they're doing under Dave Norton. I agree with you that. NC State has, just like in baseball, they have to fight left-handed sometimes. They do. And I, that Carolina has an advantage. But I do think in the last 25 years or this century, I do think NC State has had better players than North Carolina. And I do think they've had better teams than North Carolina. That's, that's but they haven't. But they coaching. haven't been able to take advantage of those years when they've had them. Like, think about it. I just did a list for uh, Saturday Road where mm -hmm. it's the top, 50, uh, 25 players in NC State's history. 20, 20 or 25 players in NC State's history, right? 25. All, almost all of them are, in a lot, are, in, are since 2000. Since Chuck. You know, and you want to include Torrey Holt, 98. Like, I mean, Russell Wilson, Philip Rivers, Mario Williams, mm -hmm. Peyton Wilson, you know, just just Philip and Russ. They had dudes. The, just Philip and Russ. You had seven years of a front line NFL starter, mm -hmm. and you couldn't so much as win the fucking league. Like that doesn't make any sense. And Clemson was not running hot. Now Florida State, Florida we, had, State we had a tail was. end of Florida State for Philip. Tail end. Philip Philip had a winning record against Florida he State. He did have. Well, there's there's also a Chuck Amato. What did he value? You sure? Type thing. And they always sure. had those teams ready so, to go against Florida State. When North I think, Carolina, not so much. So I guess. Uh, underachievers in the eye of the beholder, right? Like I don't, I don't think as a whole, NC State's an underachiever, no. but I do think there are years. Twenty seventeen immediately jumps to my mind where NC State underachieved. This year, this year, I was talking about I, I this. With, I was talking about this with Chip. Uh, Chip Patterson was up here getting a haircut with. Uh, what with what is the actual expectation for this team? Well, it's Chip Chuck, and we'll talk about it with Chip on Thursday. Either you is or you ain't with sure. NC State this sure. year. Right. I mean, you have Pretty sure we said that in 22, though. What and what happened? <laughs> and they fell on their face. Okay. It's like if you want to, if you want to talk about NC State currently mm -hmm. as being one win short of what they should have been every year, pretty much. I'm yeah. here for that conversation. Yeah. I'm here for that conversation. But that, that does that make you an underachieving program? That's what I'm saying. As a whole, you would say, well, you're fighting left handed. You're in this situation where you're recruiting against other, you know, programs yeah. in the state. You you got other you got larger programs coming in and poaching the top mm -hmm. talent out of the state mm -hmm. as well. I would say as a whole you say, okay, NC State, you're fine. But then when you start getting into some of those numbers and some of those the players that they have produced and you start looking at it and you're going, right. wait, what? How what? Wait, what? Why? And then you look at every ACC team not named Virginia has at least one double digit win mm -hmm. season. And, you know, the 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 real fudgy math there is with the schedule. 
um, I mean, the schedule's changed. There's 12 yeah. games every year. Yes. So, you know, back in the day, they played 11. Like, so things that people don't realize, NC State's last ACC championship team did not play in a bowl game. They went eight and four. What, they won the league and did not play in a a bowl game. That's funny. I was actually at a media. Okay. I was at a Medios this week. They weren't ranked yeah. either. <laughs> I was at a Medios this week and I was sitting at a table that had a picture of uh, 1979 and because they won it at Clemson. Yes. They, they, they clinched the league yes. at Clemson, right? And it's just like, I was just like processing uh, what exactly was considered successful back in 1979 versus what is considered successful today. So it's it's all up there. But I thought it was a. I thought it was an interesting article, and I do think there's layers to what you consider underachieving. I think that's what ESPN. To be fair to ESPN, was trying to establish with their various tiers, and I do think there's a difference between you've been one win short of where you probably should have been as a program. That's specific to NC State versus what I've seen with North Carolina, which has been given all the hype, yeah. all the access, all the all the things that you would check off a box for. Hey, this would be good. And then they can never really come through on it. They off, just can't. Off the top of my head, but I would say underachieving programs. Mm -hmm. I would say Texas. I would yes. say Auburn. I would say Miami. Ah, but modern but, Miami. But how, how modern far do you Miami. Want to go back? No, they, modern they, they Miami's five titles in our lifetime. Modern Miami is an underachieving program right now. Straight up, straight up underachieving okay. program. It's been over twenty years. I know. Joe. I understand that. <laughs> I'm just saying to you. <laughs> <laughs> Off the top of my head, UCLA is a program that should have more success than it, it has had. You could say that with basketball and football for UCLA. I don't. I actually don't think Penn State's underachieving. I think Penn State, like James Franklin has said, is one of the few programs that can win ten games a year, and people be mad that they only win ten games a year. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of NC State in Penn State. Yeah, there's a lot well, of they NC have State. not been able to break through nope. against the 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 big dogs, the top of the teams no, that have mattered the most to them. So they have not. You know, listen, it's an interesting thought process, but I, I think ultimately North Carolina, if you if you can square this and, and you have, I know you're 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 poking a little bit here in the content in the prism of this uh, article, but if you could just square, here's what North Carolina traditionally has been, here's what NC State has traditionally been. They are what they are. That's a separate conversation for me. You this is where you and I do agree when people talk about North Carolina and NC State and why you and I always chuckle when one of the programs thinks that they're leaving the other program behind. Okay. Certain text. Yeah. Uh, not even that. I'm, I'm talking about both sides. No, I, I okay. know. I know. I'm talking about both sides. I know. That every single time one of the programs thinks, all right, we, uh, uh, we're locked in. It's over. We're locked in. We're leaving Billy it Packer. It's, it's over. It's over. No, it's not because you guys are the Spider Man pointing <laughs> meme. You are the same program, just in different colors. Water will find itself. <laughs> Pretty much. Housekeeping. It's kind of like uh, us as podcasters. You know, we've just kind of found our level. It is what it is. Uh, big thanks to Enovana. Check them out. E-N-O-V-A-N-A.com. Green cleaning solutions. Let's see if I can hit the right buttons today. If you have messy sites or or cash in your cabana, you clean, clean with Enovana. Please, five stars only. Positive vibes only. If you're following us on your favorite podcast app, just throw it five stars. It helps with discovery, helps with search, helps with the algorithm. If you're watching on YouTube, throw a like on this. If you watch us every day, throw a like, leave some comments. You know we're going to read them when we get to Hey Joe. We love the comments. Also, if you're driving in your car, what's up? Hey, Kyle, how you doing? Hashtag OG Carpool Gang. Yeah, so I've been delivering hats. You have? Uh, around various spots of the triangle. You have? Because uh, people paid for access, not for the hats themselves. Um, a lot of people say, man, I got to commute. Yeah, man. And, and I've never really understood this because I, what am I driving? Six miles, seven miles? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it takes me, I mean, depending on the light cycle, it'll take me about 15 minutes to so, get to downtown Raleigh. But people who have like real jobs. Oh, dude. You know, they drive and they sit. And unlike me, they're not willing to, to listen to, you know, uh, the Rand RBI baseball mixtape that I've made on their phone. That's sicko. Over and over and over again. That is sicko right? material. Right? So they're like, man, I'm I'm tired of, of listening to like, you know, <laughs> your trash music list. So I'm going to listen to a podcast. Kyle explained this to me yesterday. So I appreciate Kyle. I appreciate everyone out there and, and the people in their 30s, our youths. The youths, baby. Taking care of us. It's funny when uh, I don't, I'm not going to have this problem this travel hockey season. Uh, but when the practices were at Wake Competition Center, 
speak competitions out, out by the airport. Yeah, Invisalign, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Invisalign doesn't pay me, so I'm just going to keep calling it Way Competition Center. Sure. Uh, and Rod has the hat that has WCC on it. Regardless, that five to fifteen, that's that's that five fifteen practice time. Oh yeah, forget it. Forget it. Yeah. I mean, I'm you like, better wow. leave it three. It's like me going to the Smith Center. Leave for, it three. Forget it. You're going to be stuck in traffic. So anyway, we appreciate all the helps for the algorithm. We've got the podcast festival coming up August 24th. Get your tickets right now. We are moving units, baby. And you can go to breeze3.com to support our presenting sponsor for the podcast festival. Uh, go to breeze3.com. Shutdown Fullcast is going to be there. Hand in the dirt. We will be there. We will be giving away bourbon. A big old handle. Two big handles of bourbon. For your full of shit, Saw that from our guy Chris coming through Very in the clutch. Very excited about that. Uh, and the party does not stop when the podcast festival ends. We're going to have an after party. We're going to have access to things. After the party, there's the after party. Yes. And then on Sunday, Jason Kirk, uh, who has a new book, will be at Quail Ridge Books in North Hills. And then you can go to that book signing and chat. It'll be a lot of fun. So go to realta.com to buy your tickets today. Podcast Festival, again, brought to you by Breeze Through. Feels like a whole weekend, man. It is a whole weekend extravaganza. Big thanks to Whitaker and Hamer. We might have to call them tomorrow if nope. I get a speeding ticket on our way to Sedgefield. Uh, WH.lawyer is the website, attorneys and counselors at law. We joke about the traffic stuff. They, they do a lot more than that, folks. A lot yeah. more than that. Full Any full kind of style. family law, any kind of closings business you're selling a business L listen if you need legal help give josh and joe a call or check them out wh.lawyer the world's greatest website i either need to put into a, into a contract for the llc that you're not allowed to wear white i know uh, I, I, for the white i, had rep it, though, no, I know I had I, you had to rip your smu today i totally yeah. get it or i'm gonna have to talk to ethan about finding a different lighting switch so that when joe wears white Triple i can D. hit i can hit that switch and then we get the thing all kind of fixed because yeah. my little TV lights are necessarily S working. SMU needs to get that uh, Paul Walter to rep the triple D. <laughs> the triple D. Um, by the way, hey girl. By the way, uh, before we move on to talk about my HDR, uh, one of the porn sites did reach out. Did they? They put the email out. Good. It did happen. Good. The it world. Did happen. Feel, everything. Feels everything. Like, everything. Feels safer now. You know what? The world is healing. Yeah. Nature is healing. Uh, the porn sites have reached out <laughs> to the hey man uh, to the Paul Walter. <laughs> Uh, go check out Hotel Realty <laughs> by HCR.com. Hey, man, I don't know what you do in your house, but I'm sure that they can find but something for you. Maybe you're, a French, maybe you're a French pole vaulter and you need to get away. Yeah. And you want to move through the triangle. You saw something on Zillow Gone Wild and you saw what they were doing with the basement. Contact my yeah. Hotel Realty. That's no, these about. are the experts in the triangle. If you're moving here or if you're moving out, don't fall for the guaranteed offer nonsense. Trust the experts. Trust the people who know this area the best. That's hometown reality. That's myhtr.com. Big thanks to Nature's Relief as well. We're going to talk about um, enhancements here in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, with Nature's Relief, you can enhance your weekend with some of their products. Hey, you, you Free can, rolls. You can enhance your Tuesday night Any with night a little sleepy, sleepy juice. Yeah, you need some sleep enhancers. <laughs> That'll work. I'm a big fan of those uh, Delta 8 CBD gummies that help you sleep at night. Really, really good stuff. Or if you're just looking to vibe while you watch the Olympics, hey, Nature's Relief got it. So check them out, naturesreliefhempstore.com, R-E-L-E-A-F, hempstore.com. Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline in studio is Alex Warren. He is the owner of Runology in downtown Raleigh. They do they, they sell shoes, but they do a lot more than that. There's run clubs. They do the races. Y'all just got done with the Sir Walter Myler, which uh, looked like it was a success last Friday. Yeah, yeah. Huge success. I think it was probably the highest turnout. And both the men's and women's records went down um, pretty substantially. The women's ran like 419, men's at 4351. <laughs> That's insane. That is sub sub four minute miles are insane to me. Three fifty. But this is why I wanted to talk to you. I brought you up on yesterday's podcast because Jillio and I were talking about Noah Lyles, and what was the thing you you pointed out that Lyles's record was the same as Ben Johnson His in nineteen eighty eight was the same as the the infamous tainted nine seven nine. Here and we the, are, thirty eight years or thirty six years later, we finally got to the. And my point did was, we get to the real number? I don't know. And that's the thing. Like my point was well. Yeah, I mean, I think we understood in 1988, uh, steroids were a little bit different. Um, and with all that time that's passed, 
I think we understand the science of our bodies a little bit better than we mm -hmm. did back in 1988. And also the technology in the shoes has improved, right? For sure. So I immediately thought of you um, because if anybody knows anything about shoes, it would be you <laughs> and what Nike is doing with technology to make these shoes as fast as possible for the runners to shave. And again, we're, you know, we think two seconds is the big deal, mm -hmm. but in this level, this elite level, you see the difference of 0 0.005 seconds. Exactly. And Nike's in the business of making sure that you get that 0 0.005 seconds. Yep. And where are we right now with shoe technology and how that impacts what we're seeing at the Olympics? Uh, the, the shoes are definitely helping out the athletes to some extent, but, um, it doesn't go just to performance. It goes to recovery. You know, you have to think about these athletes are going through rounds mm -hmm. and sprinting, distance running, anything that they're doing within the trials, it's huge impact on their bodies. So the shoes are what's going to essentially be, you know, um, protecting them from that. So the recovery times have been improved because of the shoe technologies. The times themselves have been improved because of the shoe technology. So it's multifaceted, but um, I think that, you know, where you're seeing the most gain is maybe in the, the middle distance to sprinting okay. side of it. I think that those athletes have a little bit more to gain than some of the sprinters. Uh, the sprinters are still just using so much raw power. And when you look at the technique and the amount that goes into it, it's, it's, the equivalent of, you know, uh, wide receiver perfecting their, uh, their, you know, um, their hand drills mm -hmm. or, you know, a basketball player perfecting their dribbling drills or anything like that. It's okay. just crazy. So, okay. Okay. So I'm in my brain. I, I, your logic makes sense, right? Like we, we've heard stories from Larry mm -hmm. Bird and Kevin McHale back in the day They're for the Celtics, right? Mm -hmm. What did you guys do in the off season? Well, a lot of people had jobs, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they were like, "Oh man, once the season start, we switch from Bud to Bud Light, right, you know, Miller right. Light. They switched to right. light beer yeah, when the yeah. season started, I went right? From so, a pack a day to just a couple yeah. of cigarettes. So, you know? so I get that part about recovery. In in sprinting, though, it is fascinating to me, and this is this, these are the numbers I didn't have yesterday. We literally went twenty years from nineteen sixty eight to nineteen eighty eight without a world record in the 100 meters. Mm -hmm. And and I believe if my math is right, the same in the long jump, right? I yeah, mean, it's got yeah, a lot of the sure. same mechanics when we think of, oh yeah, right? And so it's like, at the risk of uh, losing my mind here, it's like, what the fuck happened <laughs> that all of a sudden we went, we go, tw and I get what you're saying, like this is the 70s, and if you look, uh, particularly on the women's side, it was East Germany, huh? Oh, I wonder, oh yeah. yeah. I yeah. wonder what they were doing. Yeah, You know yeah. what I mean? But I think, I did see the 88 document about Ben Johnson. And that's what got my brain going because mm -hmm. we obviously have a jingoistic view of Carl Lewis. Mm -hmm. We do. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I don't know how old you are. You're, you might be too young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might be, I might be talking well, crazy I mean, to you right we now. We have the same thought on Lance Armstrong. Like, yeah. oh, how was it? You know, it's yeah, like yeah, oh, this, America. And this it's like, America's yeah. just beating all these and dopers. It's like all the dopers, right? Like, okay. So, so for me, looking at the documentary from 88 about like, yeah, well, Carl Lewis had his own issues, right? So, yeah. I have a jaded view. I I hear you when you say recovery and the and the temple that is your body. Novak Djokovic is, comes to immediately screams to my brain the way that what that guy does. Mm -hmm. And there's some longevity there. Tom Brady, obviously LeBron James, who you had mentioned. But do you really think it's possible? And and I don't know what the definition of clean is. Mm -hmm. But do you really think it's possible for the the runners at the highest level to be clean? And I think we can agree that Usain Bolt is an absolute unicorn. Yeah. Like we've never seen a sprinter like that, that size, that big, you know, mm -hmm. that stride, that strength. But my brain at 49 just says to me, I agree with you. There's a lot of good things, but I just, I, I can't get the Armstrongs and the Barry Bonds and all the other cheating examples yeah, out of my brain when I watch this yeah, stuff. Yeah. And that's fair. That's fair. Um, I, I mean, I think that like, you know, speaking to you saying, I do think that we have some absolute, you know, units in sprinting and Fred Curley's one that comes to mind. That's a big dude. And he's like, you know, he's from Texas and he's built like he's from Texas. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so just, two things from Texas. And he's, uh, he's just <laughs> like, he's former, you know, world champion, 
um, has all the hardware to back it up. Um, but I think the the sport is just changing so much that it's allowing people to get better. And one thing to think about is those athletes that were naming, you know, as far as Ben Johnson, the people back in the 80s, mm-hmm. completely agree with you. But look at the seasons change. Look at the one season. It's always one breakout season that they somehow produce like improve their sprinting in Brady Anderson to as, point a, two. As, a, as a metaphor there. Yeah. yeah or point or two seconds in a hundred. That is nuts. Mm-hmm. Like you can't do that. So to see what like Noah's Noah's been on the scene, but Noah's been on the scene in the hundred and or in the 200. In the 200s, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing that about track and field, the higher the distance you go, the less you're paid. So the closer you get, to, if you can be a hundred meter athlete, that's where the money is. Like even 200 specialists, they're mm-hmm. getting paid less than the 100 meter specialists. Why is that? It's just it's the just, it's just, the, just the sheer spectacle of the yeah. 100 meter. It's probably the attention span of, you know, the, yeah. the average human. And like they okay. don't want to watch a 5K. They don't want to watch a 10K. Well, the thing is, I'll watch. So what's funny about the track and field, the, the three that I'll watch consistently is the 100, the 200, and the mm-hmm. 1500 meter. Because mm-hmm. I, I like, you know, you're wearing your, your, your NASCAR inspired shirt. Um, what I always love about the 1500 meter is that it is kind of like little human NASCAR. Yeah. You know, you got your positioning, somebody's drafting. You can think, well, how much drafting are you getting off a human? Well, Mm -hmm. when we're talking about very minuscule amounts of seconds, that stuff kind of matters, right? Yeah. So I, I always enjoy that, but I guess, yeah, I guess it makes sense that the spectacle of the hundred meter. So this is what I find curious. So Noah Lyles' whole entire thing was he was a 200 meter beast. Mm -hmm. So what makes it difficult for you to translate from the 200 meter to the 100 meter essentially you're just you have to with the lower the distance you have to perfect everything so you know when they're coming out of the blocks it's the next time you look at it you know listen to the commentators Mm -hmm. they've been there but the amount their toes are able to come up off the ground and them stay absolute like as parallel as possible to the ground is crazy if an average human does that they fall on their face in fact nike had a uh nike had a um an installation out at the trials Mm -hmm. and it was basically just to kind of run down a hallway as fast as you could and they had a set of blocks in there almost every like you know civilian that i saw enter the blocks fell flat on their face it was like it was almost like they were creating a reel of just you know (laughs) like america's funniest videos and it's because like these people are perfecting this action over and over and over. The hurdlers, they know exactly how many steps oh. they're going to take before they yeah, hit that true. next yeah. hurdle. That's true. And as far as like steps to get out of the blocks mm-hmm. for the first 20 to 30 meters, they know like exactly where they're supposed to be. And when they don't, like you start to see that flip, oh, that, that okay. switch flip. That's when, you know, that's when uh, Noah was just like, all right, let's go. Okay. All right. To go back to my point though about the, those records, what, and what's always tripped me up mm-hmm. about track, mm-hmm. we see this in swimming, not the shoes. We that see would this, trip you up. We see this in swimming every year. If you look a world, every oh my, shit, almost every every Olympics, every mm-hmm. year, every yeah. world championship, hell, someone will break it in next week at whatever the next event is. Yeah, every single year, because of what you're saying, training, recovery, technology, whatever it might be, swimming records changed. Every single time, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, so every single time it's like, oh, so they, they just keep getting faster. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I felt like at least, and, and maybe my brain is now, you know, uh, suspended in 1988 or uh, obviously I'm, I'm caught up in all of this, but it's like tr- the track records didn't move. Yeah. You know, yeah. like why would, and I, so, science guy, Neil Tyson, whatever his name is going to come De- in here and Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to yeah. tell me about water and the, <laughs> the effects suits. of water, yeah, the suits, well, the suits, but it's like, why were they able to make such great strides in swimming? Mm-hmm. Again, world-class athletes putting all these things in their body, having the recovery, doing all those other things, yet track just seemingly stayed the same. Well, I will say that track, I mean, up until recently, or the running field up until recently was a kind of a non-approachable thing. You, so there were so many people who were just getting injured, and now like the amount of people that can enter into running because of the technologies is so much more vast okay i think that the technologies for the shoes yes it's benefiting the elite athletes but you also have the ability to 
you know, if you want to do a couch to 5k and if you're 400 pounds, like you, there are shoes that are going to help you. There are shoes that are going to get you there. I need those. Yeah. And like, they didn't have that before. Yeah. To be honest, like the shoe technologies didn't change for like 20 years. Yeah. I was going to say, go look at the, uh, go look at the shoes from 1988 versus what you can get now. And I remember I tried, again, this all comes down to what you were saying about tripping over yourself. If you're just a normal person trying to run. Um, I think this was a couple of years ago. You guys had, you guys got into the shop that new Nike that was kind of controversial, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. What was the name of that one? I forgot the, the name of that one. The Vaporfly and the Alpha Fly. Yes. It was the Vaporfly that seemed mm-hmm. to be getting a lot of, not negative headlines, but it was a controversial shoe in the marathon circuit. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I remember I tried them on and it was, I couldn't. I couldn't even walk in those things. But I guess they were not necessarily meant for walking. Oh yeah, they 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 they'll spring you forward. Yeah, oh. it was the most insane thing, and the and they were also super super tall, mm-hmm. which was another thing that was somewhat controversial. Um, and when you start when you when you try those shoes on, and you realize what exactly is happening, I do. It's kind of like a club, right? There's all sorts of weird spring and angle and various other things that <laughs> happen with the golf ball. Oh yeah, I was I was just about to. I'm laughing at myself over here. I was like, like, are you talking about like, like, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> all this technology has benefited my fat ass and gone. Right. Oh, it's, it's but, I, but not for, but not for running, not you. Hey. You need to be barefoot. Yeah, I want you in those web shoes, <laughs> those little webby shoes. Eating ribeyes. That's what I want. <laughs> because that's because I guess smoking. Because that's the thing that I find fascinating. I've always found fascinating about sports. What is the line in which we go? That technology is too much. Because most normal people who are looking for an edge will get obsessive about their golf ball. They'll get obsessive oh, about their club fit. Trust. They will. I, right. I can go to Costco <laughs> and people would buy those Kirkland balls because, you know, this X, Y, Z in baseball, we were obsessed over seam count. All right. And the exit was, velocity, everything else. Was, you were going somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grip and <laughs> Seam that was yesterday. Devil's deck. <laughs> that was yesterday. The devil's deck. <laughs> as, uh, as Chip Patterson at the cover three said, do you want to be in the devil's deck or on the devil's deck? What do you want to do? You just don't want to be behind it. No, no, you definitely don't. But re- regardless, that's the thing that I kind of find funny. And I always want to push back and like, whoa, whoa, whoa let's ask him. Let me, let me ask some questions here. And where are we with shoe technology? That's kind of helping these particular things out. And I think the one misconception is it can spring you forward all day. Mm-hmm. But if it's, if you have to run all these heats and these shoes help with the wear and tear of your body Mm -hmm. that's the point right that is a huge like that is yeah the the ground force that you're exerting in a sprint is nuts i mean our our legs would feel demolished after yeah so for them to you know be able to go two rounds within one day that's that's impressive and Mm. to still be able to perform the same times so um another thing that i kind of want to add is like noah lyles his mom was an athlete we're starting to see the day yes. and age of yeah. American track athletes having hey. parents that were athletes. Uh, it's a it's a real big mystery to me. Steph Curry, the, yeah. the, the most you transcend transcendent basketball player in the last forty years. Like, whoa, hmm. whoa, whoa, whoa. It was, a, Curry. it was a miracle. You know, like his mom yeah. was a volleyball yeah. all American. Yeah. Hey, how about this one? Patrick Mahomes, the best player in the NFL. <laughs> huh? I wonder what. Oh shit! His dad was a professional baseball player. Yeah. Like. And yeah. more importantly, they're around it. They're around it all and they, the time. They live it. So yes. Yes. my friend Hershawn Jackson mm-hmm. yeah. uh, is you what know, flex former right world yeah. champion, nice. Olympian. Mm-hmm. His daughter, Sean T. Jackson, is one of the best in the world. Weird. You know? And it's just like, <laughs> I wonder why that happens. Why? It's not why is that the case? And I think it's I think we're now starting to enter into a day and age in track and field where you're seeing the parents like produce these just amazing talents. Mm-hmm. And so that's why the times are getting faster. Okay. These kids are, these kids are spitting images of their parents and their parents are teaching them every single thing that they know about it. So they already like at 16 and 17, they already have an advantage. Makes sense. That's Alex Warren, Ronology. Uh, go check them out in downtown Raleigh and you can't ask them because I ask them all the time. Do you have this in wide? Oh, <laughs> uh, We'll try to get for you. <laughs> <laughs> Alex knows my feet are flat and wide, and that vapor fly ain't going to work for me. Uh, so you got to find. <laughs> find we, got, we got some skate shoes for you. <laughs> hey, you know what, though? Wheelies. Look, look, look. The shoe that always works for me, it has worked for me consistently, 
is that uh, Nike Pegasus Trail. It has consistently. It is. That's a great one. That is a good shoe that I wear all the time. It consistently fits me and it'll do the job of walking all day at Disney World. All day. From 8 a.m. to 11. He's trying to do some contest where I have to go to Disneyland. I'll get you a pair of shoes if you go. Okay. And they, they got, and they have some bright ass shoes, Joe. Right I, up your alley. I do like them. you love a bright shoe. They got them, man. They got them. Alex, appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks, y'all. You know, I figured it out. What we should do is we should get Roback to be the official sponsor of the secondary lighting setup for Joe Giglio. Yeah, it's usually my rollback stuff that, that causes some issues, but yeah. and now I'm excited because they do have the license for a triple D, so you will be seeing some smooth gear from our friends at Roback. They all have amazing stuff. Their golf stuff is amazing. Their hoodies are amazing. Their shorts are amazing. Now the pants are amazing. And yes, they have all kinds of different uh, clo- clothes and styles for women as well. So, do yourself a favor. Go to rollback.com, R-H-O back.com. Use the promo code OG20 Save 20%. Put a little money in our pocket. And make yourself look fresh and so clean. It's funny. You keep saying smoo. Smoo. When discussing SMU. Yeah. And I, every time you say that, it makes me think about uh, Ted Sawyer. I don't, know. You, you don't, I don't know if you remember Ted Sawyer or not. No. So Ted Sawyer was... Uh, his, his technical title was a traffic manager at 850 The Buzz. Oh, okay. Ex-CIA. Oh. He did undercover work in Japan. Okay. Now, Ted, rest in peace, was a tall black man working undercover in Japan. In Japan. Okay. I had questions. Regardless. So Ted, bless him. Um, so he would voice spots. So if you're an old 850 the buzz listener, you might remember him for doing some he was some, a big voice guy. He was a big voice guy okay. from time to time. And he had various ways he would do stuff. And there was a there was an event taking place where um Shamu was coming. I forgot what exactly it was, what it was for. Okay. But Shamu, the, the killer whale that would do the tour, and maybe it was at the North Carolina Aquarium or something like that. It was, something was going on that, sh- that Shamu was going to be there. And I got in my car, and I'm in the mornings playing, and Ted would give the updates, and then you'd hear the spots, and all of a sudden, you'd hear Ted like, well, come on down to such and such, and, such, and you can see Shmu. <laughs> <laughs> I get to the office, I'm like, Ted. Did nobody tell you <laughs> that Shamu is pronounced Shamu, not Shmu? <laughs> he goes, oh, of course he curses. Like, oh, God damn it, Joe, whoa, man. I, I'm going to fix that right now. All this other stuff. Ted was the best, man. Mm. Missed that guy. He was, an, and he was, Ted was my Rusty before yeah, Rusty. Makes sense. Right? Rusty Helzer, uh, an OG, OG, OG. The guy who never left the station. Never still leaves the station. It still, still hasn't has. left the station. I don't want to look at his PTO balance. I remember one time, this is back when Adam Gold was actually in charge of things. I know, shocker, right? Told Ted. Adam was in charge of things? Oh, yeah. He oh, was at char- 850. At 850, the bus. Okay. He was in charge of things at one point in time. Okay. Yeah, he was the program director. Adam was, was in charge of things and didn't hire me? Uh, he couldn't. Different story. Okay. So, plus, he didn't want to work at 850, the bus. Regardless, Adam once told Ted, you need to at least file for PTO. I will accept said PTO. If you come in, I don't want to know. Right. I just need for you to take the PTO so it shows yeah. what you do with it. Totally your Ted, idea. please. Get but we all know guys like that. Yes. Rusty's like that. Yes. When's, Rusty, when's the last time Rusty took a day off? Definitely not during hockey season. Whew, goodness gracious. Anyway, I digress. Get to uh, Mosquito Authority. Pest Authority. It's been gross. It's going to get grosser. Uh, with all the rain that is going to get dumped on us, thanks to Debbie. Uh, talk about a Debbie Downer. Sorry. Or, or, Wait, hold on a second. Do I have one? No, of you do not. Do I have one? I do. <laughs> oh, that's not that's not sad trombone. <laughs> <laughs> I do have the sad trombone out here. It's a don't yeah Debbie Downer. 
Uh, but don't let the mosquitoes be a Debbie Downer. <laughs> Head on over to Mosquito Authority and Pest Authority, BugsBite.com. You can bundle and save. It's also a big thanks to Happy and Hale. We're going to be at Happy and Hale. What day now? I, I always keep forgetting here. 8.15 next Thursday. 8.15 next Thursday. We're going to be out at Happy and Hale. It's going to be a lot of fun. You can come out, try their new stuff, and maybe you can even see us sing this in real time. Let's take a break. Let's take a hockey break. Brought to you by Happy and Hale. So yeah, check out uh, Happy and Hale. Download the app. It makes things a hell of a lot easier to get your food. Uh, when you pick up all that stuff, it's all thanks to Happy and Hale. We thank them for being a corporate champion. All right, let's get to lightning round item number one. I think, I think, Joe, you finally found the fatal flaw in the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, I thought I was going to sit on that one. No, no, no. Let's, let's, let, this is one of those save for later. Watch this space. Mark and save. Okay. Yeah, mark and save. So the Chiefs have locked down Harrison Butker, Panthers legend, the kicker, on a four-year, $25.6 million contract extension. 17.8 of that is guaranteed money that now makes him the highest paid kicker in the NFL, passing Jake Elliott and Justin Tucker's $6 million per year average. Joe? So just as long as I get this straight, you can get rid of the top player in the NFL <laughs> in Tyreek Hill. But let's make sure we re-up and double down on the misogynist kicker. I mean, got it. I mean, they might... they. Got it. I mean, whether he's a misogynist or not is besides the point. We know, we know in the NFL, we know in the NFL, they don't care about women straight up, <laughs> but they do care about making sure you hit that kick, which might be the difference between a Super Bowl and not Joe. Give, given how much there is voodoo in kicking, yes, and given the Taylor Swift phenomenon and what karma is and what karma isn't, man, I don't think I want to double down on that guy. I mean, I would, I would, I would, I would have signed him, whatever. But yeah. I ain't make, I ain't giving him seventeen mil. We'll see. And people are just flaunting it, like, oh, okay. So it's funny. You, you get out of the universe what you put into it now. Dude, the discourse around hair, the the, dis the discourse around Butker's a lot of reasons why I don't really spend as much time on social media anymore because people just find the things to get really, really mad about, or they misunderstand why things are that way. So like Morgan Wallen recently mm -hmm. played Arrowhead, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he, yes. You know, my feelings about Morgan Wall on a side. Sure. Cool. Sure. You know, I, I'm pretty sure I understand the reason what rocketed him to fame. Mm -hmm. All right. But he came out with a customized jersey. Morgan Wall on the back in seven. And people said, see, he's all down with Harrison Butker. Not realizing that it was a customized jersey for Wallen, who played baseball back in the day, and seven was his number. So yeah. that's his number. I think he wears it like all these other places. Yeah, and too. Wallen was on the back. And people got mad on, or not, they basically took it how they wanted to see it. You had one side going, he stands for his fucker. I'm like, nah, dude, he just got a customized jersey. Why does it have to, like, mean something? And on the flip side of that, people were mad at Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey sure. because they came out on stage with him while he was wearing that jersey. Right. Like, the Swifties like, how, this is why he, she's got to dump him. How can, she's got to dump him. And like, no, 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 no. To your point, though, to your point, I don't want to be on the wrong side of Taylor Swift mm -mm. and the Swifties. Mm -mm. And she has a song called Karma. And we'll see what happens. Just saying. We shall see what happens. And if they miss a kick, a crucial kick, Harrison Butker misses that kick. Buddy. Didn't they beat, didn't they beat the Bills last year because the Bills missed a kick? Buddy, the Swifties are going to come out in full I'm going to come out force. in full force. <laughs> well, you'll laugh. <laughs> she spent that money on Tyree. <laughs> see? <laughs> What are you laughing at? <laughs> that Bruce is the best thing. Like, that's the playlist you're going to have. It's just nothing but the lightning round yeah, for Ryan. Uh, all right. So Jim Harbaugh, former Michigan coach now with the Chargers, uh, had a comment on the draft notice of allegations from the NCAA regarding Connor Stallions and the sign-stealing scheme. 
Uh, asked about the report during a news conference on Monday. This is from Yahoo Sports. Harbaugh maintained that he knew nothing of Stallion's activities, did not commit any of the allegations raised in the draft. Quote, never lie, never cheat, never steal. I was raised with that lesson. I've raised my family on that lesson. I have preached that lesson to the teams that I have coached. No one's perfect. If you stumble, you apologize and you make it right. Today, I do not apologize. I do not participate. Uh, I did not participate, was not aware nor complicit in those said allegations. So for me, it's back to work and attacking with enthusiasm unknown to mankind. So there's two stories that are splintering from this Michigan story that I thought people have moved on from, but I guess I'm mistaken. No, the NCAA has got to assert their authority. You mentioned this yesterday, and I completely agree with you in that the NCAA decides uh, how they want to go about these things. Uh, I'll reference Chip Patterson again because we were chatting before we got recording today. And he pointed out to me, he's like, it's weird that all these other things have gone on in the NCAA with other schools and none of those stories ever get leaked. Mm. But the Michigan why. one keeps getting leaked. Why is that? I'm like, because they're mad at Jim Harbaugh. They're just mad at him. And sure. they're going to make his life miserable. And Dan Wetzel made this really, really good point over at Yahoo. I was listening to uh, the Wetzel 40 Ross Dellinger podcast when I was driving in. And Wetzel made a really, really good point that I had not thought of uh, when it comes to these notice of allegations, and you probably recognize this because you had to deal with it intensely, whether it was at NC State or North Carolina when you were writing for the paper. And the NCAA does a really, really good job of dropping these nuggets to insinuate, to drop innuendo, to make it seem like something bad was going on. But then when you really dig in and you read what the punishments would be or what they end up having, there's really nothing there. And this comes out twofold. One, in the case of Sharon Moore, Right. Yeah. He deleted, he deleted 53 text messages. No. And one thing that I completely glossed over yesterday was that they found the text messages. Remember, they had a mirror image uh, of the device. You can, you can always go to a previous version of what was on your hard drive on your phone. Yeah. Like again, the internet is forever. Yeah. Your phone, just because you delete something on your phone doesn't mean it's actually deleted. These are things that everybody should know. So they ended up finding the text messages. The incident like, looked at the text messages and what was the level of infraction they threw at Sharon Moore for that. Two? One? Level two. Two. Yeah, that's like a, hey, don't so, do that again. So clearly you didn't see anything in the text messages with Connor Stallions that made you go, you knew about it. So you had nothing there, but they made it seem like it was a bad thing. And I, and I agree that deleting the text messages initially is not something the NCAA likes. And then with Jim Harbaugh, the worst thing they can say is, well, you should have known. You ignored the red flags. I you believe was the verbiage known. that they used. Okay. It's entirely possible that Connor Stallions was just doing this. If you read, if you read anything about Connor Stallions, because I got caught up in this in the last football season. Okay. He was a they're, interesting guy. They're about to have a Netflix special about this. Yeah, it's like a I forgot what the movie's called, but yeah, there's some, but, and they're gonna get deep into the fact that he was flipping vacuums, Joe. Actual vacuums. Okay. That was a job that he had at once. Oh, oh, okay. He would take broken Buy vacuums. Yeah, he would take broken them. vacuums and sell them. Oh, okay. He was an interesting dude. Sure. It's entirely possible that Jim Harbaugh had no idea. Listen, I don't, I could get into that he's, you know, like you go do something on your own. Like, I don't know what the hell you do. But the fact that he was getting hand signals, I'm sure those hand signals were then shared in the, in the coach's room. But yes. then it got shut down by, by the NCAA in the middle of the season. Okay. Did that affect them in the college football playoff? No. And I would still argue, even if I knew your hand signals, like, you don't even, can you it's, stop it? This is not like baseball where no. I know the pitch and that's no. going to give me a significant advantage, even when you have a significant advantage. Like, We've come a long way is what I'm saying. And if I'm a North, if I'm a North Carolina fan, I would be mad at the way the conversations around the NCAA and how they go about their things has changed the yeah. last 15 years. Yes, I agree with that. If I was a North Carolina fan, I'd be looking at how people go and the NCAA is full of shit. And say, but back when, but where was, was that was, energy? Was yeah, yeah, where was that energy in 2010? Yeah, right. And I would agree with them on that. Yeah, but you know, it's about the friends we made along the way to get to this point when sure. we talk about the NCAA. <laughs> sure, it's as simple as that. We've got a lot to get to. It's a lightning round. We actually have a lot of things to get to, Joe. I don't know why you act like we don't have a lot of things to get to. Uh, this is from Athlon Sports. Deion Sanders' chaotic culture turns into locker room violence in Colorado. Coach Prime keeps it cool on the outside, but inside, it seems to be boiling over. Uh, Athlon had an anonymous player 
And this is the quote. It's like a real-life Grand Theft Auto video game, one former player said. There are many distractions with fights, guns, and money floating around. The environment is unlike any I've come from before. I mean, I don't see what the problem is. Georgia keeps getting into trouble all the time, and they're going to be a national title contender. So what's going on here? What's the big deal? If you run off as many people as Deion Sanders has run off, you're going to piss people off. You're going to have some people come out and tell some stories. Say this. I, I am curious, you know, Dion was the show last year and they put Early, him, yeah. they, they put him, they, they, he was the show and it, it, it worked. You know, they made big noon Saturday all about that. I'm, I was all for Colorado beating Matt rule and Nebraska, all those types of it things. It works in terms of getting attention, but not actual on field success. Now that the, now that we're beyond the fascination or the curiosity, the rubbernecking of what's going on at Colorado, I'm going to be really interested to see how Dion handles a year that, could be really rough for them. This was the year, like last year, it was pretty clear they had really high level skill players. And they if did. You, if you dig deep into that NCAA 25 rosters, you see that they have <laughs> two of the, they have the number one rated player in the game is Shadour yeah. Sanders and, yeah. and Travis Hunter is like three or four. So they have talent at the skill positions. Their offensive line was absolutely atrocious last year. Their defense as a whole was terrible last year. So you knew what you had to do this year. You have you got one kick at this thing now, and I do expect them to win nine or ten games this year. I really do. I don't know about that. I'm I do. Go, I'm not going that far. I think they're going to be a much better team this year. But and th- these are some of the concerns I have for NC State too. It's one thing in basketball to turn your roster over and mm-hmm. add sprinkle water and make the thing work. It's another thing in football. Uh, f- football is a continuity sport. And not all like, you know, the the person who's complaining here, not everybody is going to. And we've seen this from Mac Brown as well. Not everyone's going to be sunshine and roses. Right. And Mm -hmm. and, kind of be pulling the same way. So that's the challenge that I think Colorado has this year. But I absolutely do think they're going to be a lot. I think they will be much improved from last year. I also think this will be his last year at Colorado because I think all this guy really wants is to coach his kid. It's the lightning round. From Brett McMurphy on Twitter, FIU will hold a press conference today to announce a partnership <laughs> with Pitbull and FIU. The transfer portal is about to be out of control. Mr. 305. Dally. I mean, it is Florida International University. He is Mr. Worldwide. Don't come across that ocean. So it would make sense that he and FIU would partner up. Although I do think this is a missed opportunity for the ACC. ACC has been asking for the Paul Feinbaum of the ACC. Oh, Pitbull. I don't think you need a Paul Feinbaum of the ACC. The ACC <laughs> wants nothing but positivity. Have you right. seen Pitbull's social media? No. He's always talking about you go out there and you have an amazing Tuesday. <laughs> Dally, Mr. 305. Can you imagine Pitbull? Like I know Jim Phillips, the commissioner, does like an ACC tour. He tries to show up to every game and everything else. Can you imagine a guaranteed halftime performance by Pitbull across ACC landscape? Can JLo come too? Or? No, I need Pitbull. Okay. That's what I need. Ben Affleck should be like Boston College for life, right? Dude, have you seen the latest pictures from Ben Affleck? <laughs> have you, no, seriously, look them up when, when we're he's, done here. He's a broken man. <sighs> the outfit doesn't, that, doesn't he go through this? Like The outfit he was wearing that I saw floating around on social media he looked like the lead. He looked like Maynard James James Keenan, the lead singer of Tool, getting ready to put like the hardest industrial album you've ever listened to. Like he partnered up with Trent Reznor again to come out with this like the hardest meat beat manifesto album you've Whoa. ever heard. That's a now real. That, that's a real. I know that's a call right yeah, there. That's, man. that's a real band, by the way, for you youngins out there. Meat beat manifesto. Give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's out there. He's doing a ministry cover band doing Jesus built my hot rod. That's what Ben Affleck looked like. But ACC, y'all, you got fish bait solutions. Slipping. What are we doing here? Slipping. How is FIU partnered up with Mr. Pitbull, Mr. Miami, and not the University of Miami? Disappointing. Very disappointed in this. Very disappointed in this. <laughs> Speaking
speaking of Cubans, uh, we have a particular way that we like to make steak. Uh, there's also lechon, which is how you uh, do pork with the mojo and all that stuff. If you have a very specific cut of uh, Boston butt that you want, they can do that for you. Mm. It's not just about what's in the glass, right? Oh, and it's no, not no. just about what's in the in the frozen section of the prepared meals. If you are looking for a, it's a butcher's market. It's a butcher shop. If you want a specific cut of meat, they can do that for you. I feel like sometimes we forget about that. The butcher's market. We're caught up in the signature steak tips, the pre-made meals, all that stuff. But if you're looking for a very specific kind of thing, they've got it at the butcher's market. So check them out. Thebutchersmarkets.com. Also, big thanks to Two Roosters. Check them out online. Two Roosters.com. New month, new flavors, Joe. Peanut butter cookie. Is the answer. Okay. I know I tell you this every month. I know you're going to accuse me of crying wolf at this point, but peanut butter cookies, easily the best flavor that they've had yet. It's unreal. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to have to go out and check it out here soon. I might get around to it this weekend. So check them out. Two roosters.com. Check out those new flavors. They're rotating all the time. They're absolutely fantastic. Again, that's two roosters.com. And Hey Joe is brought to you by Crank Arm. Check them out, crankarmbrewing.com. Mention Butcher's Market. You can get Crank Arm beer at the Butcher's Market. That is corporate synergy. We love to see that. And speaking of two roosters, I'm just saying on threads, can't come home empty, empty handed. Two roosters, two pints coming back from two roosters. I also got the ice cream cake on Sunday. Yeah. The Oreo cookies and cream cake. Okay. Whew. Dude, <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> Dear Lord, right. so good. Uh, from my guy B Pays over at 95.3 The Beat. Oh. <laughs> Again, B Pays does really, really good mixes on 95.3 The Beat. <laughs> um, he's like, agreed. P. Pablo's Freak Leak is his biggest song. So there you go. Because if you listen to it, it is an inter... I forgot what order it is. It's either an interpolation of Usher's Yeah or vice versa. One came before the other. And if you listen to both songs, oh, really? the synth and the phone ring are essentially the same. Oh, one just went to Petey Pablo first or Usher first. And that's how it ended up working. Oh, out. interesting. So I forgot which order it is. I'm sure somebody in the comment section will correct me. Speaking of the comment section, uh, let's go to the YouTube comment section from Ken hand in the chlorine. Glad to see <laughs> Candace Cooper is on. Always enjoy her insights and humor. Ken did have a question about the premium content we're about to be delivering okay ken wants to know if we can have um special episodes where we play you the unedited versions of songs for the first yes. time just to get your reaction <laughs> like freak a leak it would be difficult to monetize those <laughs> but yeah, yeah it would it would we would get flagged for that stuff from gene <laughs> maybe now that the infamous pole vaulter can be a spokesman for Spanx underwear as elaine on seinfeld <laughs> uh, said i don't know how you guys walk around with those things <laughs> yeah it's a good question <laughs> That is a good question. Uh, also from, yeah, from Curtis, Nick Wright is a KC Homer. I, I understand that. And from Zach, today's word cloud features <laughs> dong and piss missile. Folks in the, <laughs> folks, this is the OG in its truest <laughs> form. Great episode. Speaking of which, let's get out of here with a OG sports phone message that was left for us. Hold on a second. I got to play the right yeah. uh, I got I to gotta play the, the sports phone music. That might be the <laughs> dumbest one and also my favorite one. All right, let's go to the OG sports phone. Hello, guys. This is Jim Nance. Uh, I was listening to your Monday show, and the two of you were kind of making fun of the Olympian that lost out on gold because his genitalia was on the large side, and I had to comment on this. I found this very offensive because, yes, I have a large penis. Do you know what it's like to be picked on your whole life because you have a big member? Let me tell you, it wasn't fun being called names like Pop Can, the Cornstalk Cowboy, Fetus Feeler, Zamboni Baloney. 
miracle meat, and yes, even the piss missile. Sir Nick was the worst, that pretentious prick. So think before you speak. Also, I wanted to give a shout out to one of your sponsors, Nature's Relief. A good friend of mine named Alan that you met this past winter, Joe, at the Lancelot Sports Complex in Roanoke, Virginia, was in town over the weekend and visited their store. He was very pleased with what he purchased. When I talked to him last night, he was so fucked up, I thought I had accidentally called Ozzy Osbourne. Love the show, guys. And to all of the New York Rangers fans, uh, go fuck yourself. I love when Jim Nance calls. Such a fan. Big big fan of the pod. Big fan of the pod. Friend of the pod. What was the uterus? <laughs> the fetus feeler. <laughs> Whew. all right on that note y'all have a good but Tuesday. we've got a lot to get to. we got a lot to get to today we got a lot to get to we'll see y'all from hopefully hopefully we'll see y'all at, uh, at the Wyndham uh for the pro-am we'll we'll be a little bit late tomorrow but uh we'll have some fun